morning and welcome to the TPC Tranco webinar series. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to today's presentation of Solar Power Basics. Uh, before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, we are definitely going to do some Q&A at the very end of the presentation. On your um, GoToWebinar tab on the right hand side, you'll see a little section on the bottom for questions. Just type your question in there and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. The most common question I get is, will this presentation be available to us uh, in a PDF form? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. At the, re at the conclusion of the webinar, you will get an email thanking you for your participation. Just respond to that email um, with a request for the webinar, and I will get that uh, emailed out to you very quickly. There will also be a recording of the webinar placed on our YouTube channel. If you need a link to that, please also request that in an email, and I will make sure that you get copied on that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, speaker today. Ryan Smith is a, an electrical engineer and instructor for TPC Tranco, and he is going to take you through uh, today's webinar on solar power. Ryan? Thanks so much, John. Good morning, everyone. Like John said, my name's Ryan. I'm going to be talking with you guys just for about 45 minutes or so um, about our some solar power basics and giving you guys a little rundown of some of the solar power um, class material that we have as part of our company as well. Um, our, all of our classes, in, including this one and, and others, are geared toward maintenance personnel as, as much as possible. The people who are actually going to be working on this stuff so that they can. But my big thing is to understand why these things work the way they do. I know a lot of people see, for instance, solar panels on their rooftops and things like that. And knowing how they connect to the systems at large and how they connect to their homes and, and how they really work. Um, that's really my, my purpose in, in this session with you guys, to give you an idea of how these solar panels really work and, and maybe, maybe lift the veil from some of the, the magic fairy dust that might be behind it. So we as a company, TPC training. Uh, we offer all sorts of different uh, training options and services for people looking for technical education um, in their field. We offer training online with TPC online. We offer our instructor-led training in the classroom in cities uh, in all 50 states in this country to, through our TPC Train Co. and TPC uh, instructor-led training brand. We also have some uh, um, technical uh, applications and ways to make your process better by putting your schematics into our specialized programs such as TPC Operate as well as TPC Consulting Services for understanding your arc flash studies and other things that um, you might be looking to do. So we have all sorts of different ways to, to help you guys out and, and help build your education in the workplace. This is me. Uh, my name is Ryan. Uh, I've been uh, in the training space for a number of years now, and I've been in the industry as an engineer for about 11 years now, uh, working for all sorts of different places. Uh, worked as a process improvement engineer at a recycling center over in Michigan, um, and also worked for a renewable energy uh, company who was developing some renewable energy technologies in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, solar powered, wind powered systems, also uh, uh, alternative fuels like hydrogen and biofuel power stuff too. Spent some time in Liberia, West Africa, doing some trainings for people, getting them interested in careers in engineering and technical skills. Um, definitely didn't have a webinar capability in those common environments. So it's really cool to be able to use our technology today to have, it looks like 131 of you to have access to this and be able to join this discussion for this short period of time. So glad to have you all here. At the end of the day, solar panels are electrical, devices, electrical, um, don't want to call them machines, but they're definitely electrical devices at the end of the day. Um, you'll see that solar panel systems, um, whether they be, you know, polycrystalline, monocrystalline, we're going to talk about these different things, but there's really no moving parts in a solar panel. So what we really find is that once the sun is hitting these things, there's an immediate flow of electrons, we call it. And so to understand how a solar panel works, we definitely have to start by understanding how electricity works a little bit and some of the basics behind that. Since solar power is primarily electrical, um, the three basic cornerstones of electricity are going to be really important to understand. And that means no matter what it is, whether it be 
you know, a transformer, a panel with a bunch of control devices with relays and motor starters and, and inverters and converters and, and battery systems and all these complicated electrical stuff, in, including our cell phones and computers in modern day. They all operate on three basic principles, and th this also includes solar panels. This first principle being the idea of current. Current is the most fundamental um, basic of electricity, followed by voltage, and then resistance. So for us to fully understand uh, solar panels, we have to understand the ideas of current, voltage, and resistance, and how they play together. Now, in the field, we and I've been guilty of this too, is mixing up the idea of current and voltage and what they actually mean. Um, it, does current cause voltage or does voltage cause current and vice versa? Well, I could definitely talk about this with you guys for hours and hours on end about these things. And, and you'll know that people who are in electrical engineer, in, in any sort of electrician or electrical engineering trade, they spend their whole careers talking about just these three words over and over and over again. So I'll just give you a really quick rundown of what these are all about. So current, is a flow of electrons. So current is the thing that you can experience and that you can witness with electricity. Um, this is the stuff that does the work. As those negatively charged electrons flow through a circuit, they're actually powering the devices. They're, they're turning on the motors. So when a motor is running, there's current flowing. When a light is on, there's current flowing. Now what's behind that current flowing? What's the push making those current, those electrons flow to begin with? That's the voltage. So what we're going to find in a solar panel power system is that the solar panels are our voltage. But if you ask yourself in the room you're sitting in now and you look up on the ceiling and you look at your lights are shining, what's the voltage for those lights? Because we know since they're shining, there's current. But the voltage for us usually is the electricity grid. So we're taking in advantage of hundreds of miles of electricity uh, grid wiring and systems to get our power normally. Whereas a uh, solar panel system, we might just be getting our power right from our own rooftop. So it really changes the idea that incorporating solar into our everyday life will change the idea of where we get our power from and where we get our voltage from. Then there's resistance. So resistance is usually comes in the form of the device that's plugged in to the, uh, into the system to do that work. So, if the solar panel is the voltage, then the resistance is going to be the thing using that voltage, whether it be the light bulb or the motor, or maybe your appliances like your microwave, your refrigerator, your TV. And in modern day world, um, more technological devices like our cell phones and our uh, computer, those are all ideas of resistance or what we call the load. And to understand how to size and to um, work on your solar panel system correctly, you've got to understand those loads or those things that are going to act as resistance. So we, so we have voltage on one side pushing, we have resistance on the other side using up that voltage, and then we have current flowing all through a circuit. That's really the basics of how these things are related. And they come together with a little bit of mass, that one volt of that electromotive force, or basically that voltage, right? It's a force that moves electrons. That's what electromotive force is all about. It'll force one amp of current. So we measure current in amps to flow through one ohm of resistance. So that's kind of the idea there. Here's a little pie chart that we use in our classes to, to kind of get into the math of it. We try not to get into math in our training courses. We really want to get into the more practical, technical side of understanding these things. But this is kind of what we use, uh, where E represents the voltage, I represents the current, and R, R represents the resistance. And so if you ever just imagine covering up one of these letters with your hand, and you see which ones are left over. So if you covered up the letter I, for instance, you'd see an E and then over an R left over. And so that means if you ever want to find out the current, you cover it up and you have voltage divided by resistance. So basically, if you ever know two of the three things in your electrical circuit with a solar system, you can figure out the third one. This is most accurately used with direct current. And we're going to find that that is exactly the language that solar panels operate in is direct current as well. One other important concept. So I, I just told you guys that everything is based off of current voltage and resistance, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. But we all know that electricity can be a little bit more complicated than just three basic things. Well, one way we can dig down into these three things is the idea of power. So power, we sometimes say 
you know, are we getting power here? Are we getting power there? Especially when we go into an electrical panel with a meter. Do we have power here? Well, we're really asking, is there voltage here? But um, in our case, in, in, this, in this example, power is when you put voltage and current together. So if you put the voltage and you put the current and you put them together by multiplying them together, you get something we call power. And we measure that power in watts. So really the way, the idea of watts is telling us how much work we can do with our electrons. So we know they're gonna flow and we know they're gonna be pushed a certain amount, but how hard are they going to be, how, how much work are they gonna be able to do? That's the watts. So in our everyday world, that's really what we wanna know, isn't it? We wanna know how much work we can do with our solar panels. In other words, how, how many of my appliances can I run in my home or my business? You know, can, can I run my TV and my microwave and my, um, you know, and my water heater kind of thing at home? Or, or can I run all the lighting in my warehouse facility, for instance, off these solar panels? Well, this idea of watts and power is the way to go. And you're going to see on any spec sheet for a solar panel, which one of our big goals of this, the two day solar panel class is that you could have your hands on a, uh, uh, basically a spec sheet for a solar panel and be able to understand all the jargon that they're using to, to talk about that. So I'm going to try to dig down into that over the next half hour or so with you guys. And the idea of power is big. Basically every solar panel is rated in watts. That gives you an idea of how much current and voltage co combined it can provide for you. And then we also want to know, okay, that's how many watts it can deliver, but how long will it deliver those watts at? So a lot of times uh, that's called kilowatt hours or, or KWH. And that's really how our utilities tend to charge us for our power. So we'll get into that a little bit more. So let's get into the idea of how the so photovoltaic, right? It sounds like a really cool word, but it makes sense. Photo, right? Being light, kind of photons from the sun, light, light particles, uh, energy, light energy from the sun and voltaic. So that's creating a voltage or creating an electrical potential from the light and the sun. So basically creating electricity directly from light. That's what solar panels can do. And it's pretty amazing how they do it. And it's just the natural properties of the material we've discovered that can do that. So at the very heart of any solar panel system is something we call the solar cell. And so here's an idea of a solar cell. Now this isn't to scale, this is definitely blown up. This is just a couple inches wide. Um, really, really small. These have been able to get smaller and smaller over the years. So a single solar cell is enough to produce about half of a volt. Well, if you think of your own homes or businesses, how many volts do we need to operate our machines? Well, in today's you know modern day world in the United States, that's 120 volts. And if you go over you know in Europe, um, you know in the UK and other places, you need up to 220 volts to, to do any sort of uh, useful work in your homes and businesses. So if one cell, one tiny little solar cell like this can produce a half a volt, we might need a lot more of them all strung together to get up to that voltage we need. And that's where we start getting full panels. So in kind of summary, the sun's light is gonna come down on, on these, uh, these solar cells. And when the sun, sun's light hits this solar cell, you, we can kind of measure how much of that sun's energy is coming in. And that's in watts, right? That's how much kind of energy or work is happening from the sun's light directly, all the heat and all the ultraviolet rays and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, what's pretty amazing about this material in this uh, solar cell, it's made of what we call a semiconductor material. And Basically, the electrons are going to bounce out off their electron shell and immediately start flowing, just like that. And so it's just the right material where it's just conductive enough that the energy from the sun is enough to make it conductive. And so what comes out of this thing are electrons flowing. Right? And that's an electrical energy in watts. Now, what you might see here is that the sun's energy coming in is a giant yellow arrow, but the electrical energy coming out is a kind of a small era, right? And, and I'll, I'm going to come back to that. So that basically these solar cells are not 100% what we call efficient in producing power from the sun's energy. So that's one of their limitations. But hey, if you're getting any energy from the sun, that's free energy for you because that sun is going to be shining no matter what. So we're going to talk about that. So like we said, we need these 
solar cells to to come together to provide us with enough voltage or enough push on our electron. And so kind of here's the way that we end up stacking those systems together. So you start with a cell, and then when you string together those cells, you get what we call a module. And so a lot of people talk about talk about solar panels, um, you know, panels. And really what, what the technical term is for those panels is a module. So, you know, roughly about the size of a tabletop, you know, maybe, maybe two or three feet wide by, you know, four or five feet long. It really depends on the make and manufacturer of these things. But usually a module consists of, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of the little cells all strung together to get enough voltage for the application that we're going to be looking at. So um, cells together form a module. A module is another word for a panel. Kind of what what's the difference between a panel and a module? There's really not much. But then we stringle, string up all the modules together and that's what we call an array. So if you guys have ever heard of a solar panel array, that's exactly what it is, is multiple um, panels put together. So this is where we're just starting to talk the talk and walk the walk of the, the solar panel industry and what some of the terms they use. Now, if we put multiple arrays together right, into array after array after array, you can see up here we stack them all together. Now we have what we call a solar powered system. Now, what the system has that an array doesn't have is all that stuff in, that is that has to go along with it. It's peripheral stuff to make the solar panels work, and that is uh, energy storage, voltage regulation, uh, voltage uh, surge protection, uh, combiner boxes, inverters, converters, and any other kind of communications devices, that kind of stuff. So we're going to get into a little bit of those peripherals here in just a few minutes just to give you an idea of what those are. Again, this this is a broad overview, but I hope to give you guys just a kind of a good taste of what's going on with these solar panels. So like I said, these are made, the thing that makes the magic happen in a solar panel is that they're made of what we call a semiconductor material. They're not completely insulated like rubber or glass or something like that, but they're not completely conductive either. They're kind of somewhere in between. They're not made of copper or solid metal either. Um, they're semiconducting. And so there are some really crazy or what we call technical kind of rare or, or even man-made semiconductors that we've made. But the most naturally occurring one that we can find most often to make solar panels the cheapest is something we call monocrystalline and polycrystalline silicon. Okay. So you've heard of silicon or silicone um, in all sorts of consumer products. And that's because we can find the silicone or silicon um, element in the ground, right? It's it's naturally occurring um, to be mined in different ways. So, in some ways, right, we still have to mine out of the ground what's what we get from a solar panel. But the fact that they produce so much more power and energy than what it takes to make them make them a net positive uh, for environmental footprints. There's also something we call amorphous silicon, uh, which is so monocrystalline being one common. Uh, kind of texture of the silicon. Polycrystalline means there's a bunch of different textures and amorphous means it's all one big kind of uh, uniform liquidous kind of texture. Instead of hard crystal, it's more of a kind of flexible um, silicon. But here's some of the other ones. There's gallium arsenide is, is one that's being considered in the industry as well as something we call cadmium telluride. Uh, so there's all sorts of, you know, really interesting um, developments and research being done on, on, okay, what's the best semiconductor material? And right now the industry is capitalizing on this silicon because A, it is cheap, B, it is readily available for us in the industry. So if, if you're wondering what you might have on your buildings, if you guys have one, here's kind of a telltale sign. Uh, if you take a look at polycrystalline, you can see, you can see the crystals, right? You can see the different crystal shapes and shards inside of the the uh, the solar cell, whereas the one on the right is uniform. So that's one type of crystalline solar cell. As you can probably imagine, it's a little bit tougher to get to to achieve a monocrystalline solar cell because we have to manufacture it just so that the, the crystal stays uniform throughout throughout the entire 
um, way. So what we find is that monocrystalline is just a little bit more efficient. You get a little bit more watts out of it per square foot of this stuff. However, as you can imagine, monocrystalline cells are a little bit more expensive than polycrystalline because they have more manufacturing to make. So what, what I usually say about the difference in, in which one to choose if you have the choice, right? Uh, monocrystalline, if you have a very small footprint, let's say a small roof that you want to maximize the amount of power output you can get in a small space, go with monocrystalline. But if you have no limit, let's say you have an open field and you want to put out some solar cells and you're going to be putting out a lot of them, polycrystalline is the way to go because it's a little bit cheaper per square foot. And here's, that, here's something we call amorphous. Now, this is really kind of the cutting edge ideas that a lot of people are making are using the idea of amorphous silicon um, stuff. Because as you see here, it can be rolled out like a, like a sheet. And because of its flexibility, people are using amorphous silicon as solar roof shingles, for instance. Um, these can be wired in as solar um, kind of sidings on cars. People are using amor amorphous silicon to have on the roof of their cars, for instance, to power their instrumentation and their dashboard devices, or even charge their cell phone inside their car, something like that. Um, all sorts of different ways to use amorphous silicon and kind of uh, have it fit into your existing footprint and be very uh, seamless as part of, let's say, your home or your, your business. So how do these things really work on a kind of closer level? Well, on a given panel, electrons flow, I guess on a given anything, electrons flow by flowing from negative to positive. So what ends up happening is we get a negative charge on the upside of the, or the top side of this panel, and we get a positive charge on the, on the underside or undercarriage of this panel. And so negatively charged electrons as you can see represented here, they are going to flow from negative to positive. And so they're going to flow from, from up here through that light and then down here. And then what happens? Are they, are they destroyed? Are they gone forever? Absolutely not. We never destroy electrons. We just keep circulating them. So what will happen next is that it would, the electrons will eventually make them their way through this membrane from the positive to the negative and back through again. So it's all the way that that material was designed. Um, with that stuff. So it's between the N and the P, it's what we call the PN junction. That's one thing a lot of people talk about is the PN junction um, in terms of designing these things. But kind of starting to look at, well, what else is there other than the solar panel? It's always important to make sure to remember that solar panels produce DC power. And so what we mean by that is it's direct current. So DC stands for direct current. And that is, you're, like we see here, you're gonna see a constant flow of electrons flowing like a, like a highway of electrons going straight forward all the way through the circuit and back through again. So it's kind of, kind of uh, just going like that. Whereas AC is what we normally have in our building. So that's what the really interesting challenge we have with, with PV and photovoltaic is that solar panels operate in direct current but we need alternating current, AC, in our homes and businesses because it, that plug on the wall in, your, in the room next to you, the plug that you pl you're plugging in your phone or your computer into now is AC, it's alternating current. So because of that fact, we have to cope with that fact by saying, okay, DC, if I'm getting DC from a solar panel, I have to convert that DC to AC. So one way we could go through it as well Let's just, let's just make our loads. Let's make our appliances and, my, and our stuff that we plug in DC. Well, that's easier said than done because all of our plugs and all of our outlets and all of our appliances operate off of AC, right? But there are DC um, loads coming out today. There's DC light bulbs, for instance. That, those are LEDs. So believe it or not, our, our light-emitting diodes, LED lights that are kind of becoming popular nowadays are DC devices that have been basically outfit or retrofitted to work on AC, okay? But there are but LEDs on their own are DC devices that we could use to power directly off a solar panel and make it much more efficient. Also DC powered uh, motors, as you can see here, and battery powered system, anything battery powered can be run off of DC, right? So that means our cell phone and our laptops and computers can be run off of DC. 
but most mostly it, for practicality in the modern day American and European world, AC is what we're going to need to get over to. So that means getting our solar panel DC signal through what we call an inverter. Okay. So that inverter is the really key here, um, a key peripheral part of any solar powered system to get us from direct current to alternating current. So to get that straight line signal to a wavy line signal um, of alternating current. So any of our stuff that we plug into our wall presently is considered AC. Anything that has a motor usually um, uh, in, our, in our facilities, for instance, our three-phase motors, our, our conveyor belt motors, our, um, our material handling systems, all, all those kind of motor-driven loads are AC. So really we want to do that, we have to use that inverter. Now that inverter, the fact that we're using it, makes makes about up to you know 15 20 even 30 percent of our solar panels watts right will actually get used up or lost in, by using that inverter so that inverter isn't 100 percent efficient so we lose some of that power that we get off of that solar panel as heat or as dissipated energy through that um, inverter so it comes with its drawbacks there's a lot of people in the industry today talking about well, can we just go DC all the time? And the answer is absolutely, that's possible. We just have to kind of change that mentality of, of AC in today's world. But there's a lot of people talking about, okay, how can we do DC solar panels to DC loads, to DC computers, to DC refrigerators, to DC um, motors and DC everything? Because there's DC versions of everything that's also AC. Now, if let's look in a little bit into the um, specifications of, of solar panels. Got about 15 more minutes together, 15, 20 more minutes together. So um, definitely want to make the best of it with you guys. So we have something we call an IV, IV curve. Um, and that's not intravenous. That's actually um, current and voltage. Current being I and V being voltage and how they come together and how they work together in a solar panel or a solar cell. And so... A really good way to talk the talk with these solar manufacturers, especially if you are trying to troubleshoot these things, trying to troubleshoot these uh, solar panel systems. Let's say you know they're not producing what you think they should. I think it'd be really important for you to understand these IV curves. And here's an example of one: an IV curve for a given solar panel or a solar cell. This is a really typical shape you might expect to see of an IV curve, and it's kind of really important for us to understand what these mean. And this really puts you on that cutting edge of understanding what the heck a solar panel is by understanding these IV curves. So what is this telling us? Well, this is telling us, see if I can uh, give you guys a little bit of a laser pointer here. So I got a little red dot coming up on the screen. And so right up here is what we call the short circuit current of the, of the solar panel. So you see that on this axis here, we have current, and on this axis down here, we have voltage. And so as current changes, voltage will also change with, to go along with that. So you can't get maximum current and maxed out voltage at the same time because these panels can only do a certain amount of work at a certain amount of time. But up here, we have what we call the short circuit current. That means if we have zero voltage and maximum current up here, well, that doesn't seem very practical because with zero voltage, guess what? We're not getting any work done. So this is our short circuit current, which means that we actually touch the positive and negative leads of that solar panel directly together. And that's a short circuit, right? It, touching hot and neutral or plus and minus. If any of you out there are electricians, we know that touching hot to neutral or touching red to white, touching uh, black to white, makes things go boom. <laughs> it makes things really blow up and we never want to have that happen. But for a solar panel, for a single solar cell, it's not it's not the end of the world. It's not going to blow things up, but it, things will definitely get hot because the, the current is going to go as high as it can possibly go, it, which is right here. Now, as we start, as we start putting more and more load or more and more um, resistance on this, on this solar cell, we're going to see that we're going to move along this curve. To a certain point that's right in the middle and I'll come back to this but at, as the load on this increases as the resistance on this increases 
and increases and increases, that current's going to eventually drop off as the voltage increases to the point where we get down here. And this is what we call the maximum voltage. For us, it's called the open circuit voltage. <clears throat> so the open circuit voltage, VOC, is the point where the voltage is maximized, but also this, this voltage isn't very practical for our solar panels either because an open circuit basically means that the solar panel is not hooked up to anything. It's negative and positive leads on this solar panel are literally just sitting there in open air. And so a solar panel needs to be hooked up to something to actually do some work. So this open circuit voltage isn't as practical either, but it's good to know what its maximum voltage should be if it's, let's say, disconnected from the system and then you take a meter across it. You should read that open circuit voltage. And if you're not, this can give you a telltale sign of maybe there's some damage in that solar panel. Maybe one of the cells have gotten overheated and gone bad, which is a, which is which can be a common symptom of problems with your solar panel. But somewhere in the middle is the maximum, is the optimum, which is right here, the, the optimal scenario for our power inside of a solar panel. And so this is really where we wanna be operating. And it's really important for us to know where this point is. And, and by that, I mean, what current are we operating at and what voltage are we operating at to get this VMP and this IMP. And this, this is our maximum power voltage and our maximum power current. Because when you take that voltage, this voltage here, which is, you know, in this case, it's about 80% of the maximum open circuit voltage. And then this short circuit, this current here, which is just slightly less, maybe 5% less than the short circuit current in this case, you put them together, you multiply them together, that's gonna get, that combination of multiplying these two together are gonna give you the maximum watts out of this thing. And that's really what we want, right? We want the maximum work to be done out of any given solar panel. So we wanna operate that solar panel in this range here. And so knowing where that is and, and then going to your readout in your facilities, which a lot of facilities that run these things have these, where it's a little dashboard readout that says, here's, here's our voltage in our system. Here's our current that's running through the system. And here's our wattage that's running through the system. And knowing what your maximum power specs are, then going through that. It's, it's a really important um, aspect of this. So moving forward from here, let's see how we can um, put these solar panels together into an overall system, just to kind of give you an idea of how these can be connected into your homes or into your businesses. Generally speaking, there's two types of solar paneled systems. Um, they're going to be standalone or utility interactive. Now, in today's world, usually for, for um, cost effectiveness, a lot of people are opting for the utility interactive systems. Standalone means literally you could be living in the woods, right, completely off the grid and getting your power entirely from your solar panels. Now, what does that mean? That means you have the challenge of how am I going to do anything at night, right? If the sun's not shining, um, how am I going to do that? So usually in a standalone system like you see here, the solar panels are going to be outfitted with, put my pen here, with these batteries right here. So these batteries are an important part of any standalone system because that way you can run um, you can run your power at night as well. Now, in this case, the people said, well, we want a little bit more assurance than that, especially if we had a cloudy day today and we didn't get enough charge on those batteries. They use a generator backup as well. But just recall, this generator operates in AC. So if, if this um, solar panel operates in DC and the generator operates in AC, we're going to have a little bit of challenge there, then we're going to need this inverter as well. So an inverter is a key part of any solar panel system. Another part we're going to see featured here is this charge controller. I know I'm getting a lot of red circles here, but this charge controller is, is really critical for the health of your batteries. So these solar panels will be pumping electrons into these batteries and charging them up for later usage. But we don't want to overcharge those batteries, right? And so these batteries will keep accepting electrons until they get damaged, basically. They are they are just going to keep going until we just overfill them and they overflow and basically they overheat um, with those electrons. Well, this charge controller can, can sense 
when these have reached their maximum charge and shut down or basically disconnect those that solar panel when you need it. So charge controllers are important. And so just as much as overcharging is an issue, over discharging is another issue. And that's what this low voltage disconnect is all about. So um, these these use a series of electronics to to kind of do a little bit of a diagnostic on the battery's charge level, similar to what our cell phones give us in the upper right hand corner. They uh, they say, okay, once these batteries are discharged, you know, let's say to 10 percent. <laughs> excuse me. Once they're discharged to 10 percent they're going to go and, and uh, shut down those batteries and, and, and disconnect them from our circuits. In this example, they have DC and AC circuits for, for their use, which I think is a good thing for them. So here is a grid tied, or what we call a utility interactive system, where the solar panels are providing a power in DC, right? DC coming off these things, but then we see that we go through the inverter, so now we are operating an AC going into our homes. So now that we're operating an AC going directly into our house, we can have our solar panels providing some of that power, but then our grid supplying the remainder of that power that we need. So you can kind of use this as to your advantage to knock down your utility grid. And so you wouldn't get power from the solar panels when the solar panel doesn't work. So then you'd be, but the good thing is that you can still go entirely off the utility grid in this case. The grid tied system um, with batteries. So, so then we can start saying, so this one here doesn't have any batteries. So basically, as soon as you, the sun goes behind the clouds or the sun goes down, we lose the power from those, that solar panel immediately. Right? And so we have to go on 100% on grid power at night, for instance. However, we could also have a grid tied utility interactive system with batteries. So you can see we could have a battery bank as well as tied to the grid, the battery bank down here, tied to the grid up here. And then um, we could power off those batteries until they're drained and then, and only then switch to our grid. And that can really significantly um, reduce our power usage uh, from our utility, which is you know where, what we get charged money. So with about the last 10 or so minutes left, I want to give you guys an idea of what the overall um, kind of industry is looking like for photovoltaic, J just to give you an idea of this. And I know, especially if most of you are maintenance technicians on the phone, maybe some of you are in the business space, but um, give you an idea of kind of what's out there when it comes to solar panels. And most importantly, photovoltaic, because that's, that's really the thing I want to focus on. In terms of photovoltaic technologies, there's two main um, avenues that you could take. One is getting a flat plate, and the flat plate is what we've been talking about up to this point. Basically, a flat panel that can take the energy from the sun and immediately convert it by facing that panel up toward the sun. And so there's thin films, or what we call the, that amorphous silicon. We have the monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and there's, there's also this really technical kind of new type called spheral that's being developed in laboratories out there as well. But then there's other ways, and we kind of already talked about this, um, the junctions being, you know, that, that connection between negative and positive. But then there's concentrators too, and concentrators are kind of interesting as well. Um, they're a little bit more mechanical, but, but imagine a series of hundreds of mirrors reflecting the sun's light, and that light going all focused into one common point. You can imagine how hot that will be, right? And maybe we've all held a magnifying glass and it can concentrate the sun's light to a point and you can burn things and, and catch things on fire. Well, that, that kind of concept is, is um, capitalized upon where, where you can, it, especially in the desert regions of the United States and Nevada, particularly, they have seen a few of these, um, where we shine all these mirrors in a giant field up to a central tower. And this tower ha is made of a molten salt mixture. And and heats up to incredible temperatures. And that temperature allows us to spin a generator and produce power with the sun's light. So it's kind of a way to produce power with the sun's light um, in a more kind of mechanical kind of way. So that's what's going on here. There's also a way where you could have a parabolic um, trough, we call it, 
which the sun's light will hit hit this um, curved mirror surface and it can heat up a little tube full of water. So this is kind of what you don't see here is that solar hot water heating is a big deal too, where you could have a, a tube with water flowing in it and the sun's light will hit and reflect upon that, um, that tube over and over and over again. It'll really heat up that hot water without you having to use an electrically or gas powered hot water heater to do that same job. But to understand where a solar panel is going to be most, you know, most used, it's really important to understand where the solar energy actually is. And here's here's a solar map we call it of um, solar resources in this country. And this comes from the National Renewable Energy Lab. This is a really big laboratory that's doing a lot of research on okay, how how can we get solar panels out there? Well, here's one way to do it. Um, as you guys can see, and as I'm sure you're not surprised, we get most of the sun in Southern California and Arizona and get the heaviest amount of sun. But that's not to say that we still don't get good sunlight and resources even up in the north parts of the United States. We just don't get as much. So for, for a given solar panel, let's say we have just a single solar panel. If I brought that out to Arizona, I would get 6.5 kilowatt hours per square meter of that panel every day, right? Now, it's hard to kind of make sense of that number, but that's almost twice as much as I could get in Michigan at this color. And I'm from Michigan, and yeah, sometimes we get a lot of cloudy days as well. And so you can kind of see the differences in regional basis, but that, does that mean you won't, it won't be practical to install solar panels in Michigan? Absolutely not. It just, you won't just get as much power um, from the, those panels, but you're still getting power, which means you're still getting free power. So solar panels can be just as deployable in Michigan as they can be in California, but it's good to know how, um, how long it will take to pay those back. Really interesting study was done, and, um, and then I'll close with the future of PV here in just a few minutes, um, that if we took the average sunlight from this graph, right, across the country, and we we deployed solar panels up until the point we got to the wattage that we use as a nation of, in the United States. That if we had a field full of solar panels, just the size of this green square here, which is, you know, uh, you know, a third or, a, or even 20% of the land mass of, let's say, Nevada, right? this little square. If we had solar panels enough to fill this square, we could power our entire electricity usage in this country, which I, I feel is kind of an interesting thought process to go through. That means there is enough land mass available. If we were able to dedicate those resources, we could actually get enough solar panels to power this entire country, assuming that, of course, the challenges of energy storage are met, as well as getting the um, grid to deliver this power from one location to everywhere in the country. Okay. So that, that equates to about, uh, about 17 miles by 17 mile footprint per state, um, and it could supply, I guess not all, but 90% of our current electricity, which is pretty interesting. And, and this comes from the idea of brownfields. So they say if we if we had these, these basically empty lots, that's what we're, like empty abandoned lots that are throughout this country called brownfields that people aren't developing on, but they want to, well, why not put some solar panels out on those empty lots, use those to suck up some solar energy. If we use those, those brownfields in our country, we could supply 90% of our electricity. That's kind of where that's coming from. Vacant lots, parking lots. And this black, this black space represents how much space in our country is being used up by roads. So what if we were able to capitalize on that empty road space and, and capture some solar panel energy that way? And that's why a lot of people are looking at um, different ways. So here's that solar concentrator I described to you earlier, a field full of mirrors, really interesting. What else might we see in the future of photovoltaic power? I think we're really seeing a movement toward um, integrated solar panel technology. So solar panels integrated into cars. Here's a solar panel car from my alma mater, University of Michigan. Um, the solar car is really a cool demonstration that this, this vehicle can go up to, I want to say 30 miles per hour just on solar panels without anything else, um, any gasoline or anything. That's pretty cool. And, um, Here's some solar shingles kind of built into the, your roof so it doesn't cause any sort of 
eyesore or footprint or even challenges for installation. And then even you could have some kind of semi-transparent solar systems in your windows, for instance. There's, there's a company out there working on solar roadways where literally the road itself, instead of being made of asphalt or concrete, would be made of a solar photovoltaic material that's flexible and strong enough to withstand semi-trucks going over this. And you might be skeptical of this idea, and definitely I would say I am too to a certain degree, but there are people out there working on this stuff where maybe the road would be made of LEDs that could change and morph depending on traffic conditions. That's really exciting. And there's also... a um, an organization out there that flew what we call the solar impulse plane and this is a this is a plane that flew around the world last year just on its solar panels mounted to its wings no gas no diesel now you can imagine how much fuel that a typical airplane uses well this one was able to do it without any fuel needed whatsoever granted it was a very slow flight and it took the good part of the year to get around the world and it was nice and chilly inside that cockpit that you can see the youtube videos out there if you're ever interested in seeing um so the journey that these people took just type in solar impulse 2.0 and you'll get a little more information on that so um i think i'll leave it there kind of the, the future of of solar photovoltaic is bright i guess i'll i'll leave on this kind of spec that i just looked into yesterday on the latest price right the price of these things are coming down um you see two two dollars and eighty cents a watt right a dollar and eighty five cents per watt now if you take that to how many watts you need in your house it can be pretty affordable um you know, it's still going to be thousands of dollars because we usually need kilowatts or thousands of watts to to run a typical, you know, medium sized home and much more than that to power our um, to power our devices. But even even a small, let's say, 10 percent footprint, if, if you asked a facility, because I know I worked in a recycling center facility where our where our power um, bill, our electricity bill was. $35,000 a month easily. And so if if I was told that I could save even 10% of that every month, over four grand every month, now this solar panel is starting to look like it's gonna pay itself back really easily over. Usually the payback that most companies look for is within five years, maybe 10 years, it depends on the company. But that's an easy, that's an easy payback, especially with the tax credits available now for solar photovoltaic systems, okay? So, Cost is coming down. These things are getting more and more produced by more and more manufacturers. And so um, it might become a, uh, an everyday thing for you guys to be maintaining and working on these things and troubleshooting them. So in our solar panel class, we dig deeper from here into the specifics of, let's say, that inverter and those combiner boxes and those, and those panels and the wiring behind this stuff and seeing, okay, how can we keep these things clean? How can we maintain these things? Um, Thankfully, there's not as much maintenance as you would think on these, which is good, um, but there still is some upkeep we need to take, and, and we go through best practices of that in our two-day class. But for now, I think my time is up, and I want to I open the floor to some questions that you guys might have that John is going to help me with, uh, fielding through your questions, and I'll be able to answer uh, any questions. So thank you guys so much, and I'll open the floor for questions. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, Feel free to type in your questions into the question box on the right-hand side. Um, you know, we wanted to be very respectful of your time and try to keep this at a maximum of one hour. Uh, so there is some more information that you'll find on the presentation that I can send out. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions. Uh, but yes, I will. I will get the presentation out to anybody who asks for it. Again. You'll receive an email at the conclusion of this webinar. Just respond to that email with your request, and I will make sure to get that out to you, okay? Uh, so, Ryan, our first question um, goes back towards uh, closer to the beginning of the presentation. And the question is, which is more efficient, the polycrystalline or monocrystalline, and which do you see more out in the field right now? That is a great question. Now, definitely monocrystalline is more efficient. Um, on a square foot by square foot basis. So you're gonna get more power um, per unit of energy from the sun, from monocrystalline, because it's all the same kind of crystal. And it, But the trade-off with that is that it's going to take a little bit of 
you know, more cost to produce that one. Now, what we see, let's see, in terms of in terms of which ones are more common, we're starting to see a uptick, or I guess an increase of the monocrystalline and a decrease of the polycrystalline. So, when the solar panels just started coming out, you know, decades ago, polycrystalline was the way to go because that was the most naturally for naturally occurring form of the silicon. So we kind of got it into that packaged format. But now with more more um, economies of scale, first and foremost, you can see that the prices are coming down. But also with more people in the business of manufacturing these things on a very precise basis, we're seeing monocrystalline get higher and higher because of its uh, higher efficiency. And a lot of people look for that increased efficiency um, from solar panels. So that's, that's what I'd say. We're, we initially have seen polycrystalline higher, let's say, in the 90s and 2000s. And now we're seeing more monocrystalline kind of take it over um, in today's world. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, our next question is about uh, a grid tier system. And can you briefly explain again um, the advantages of having a solar panel system connected to the grid tier system and how that relates to having a backup power? I know you, you explain the difference with a standalone system as having nothing on the back end, but can you go ahead and explain the advantages of the grid tier system in that respect? Sure thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to take um, my slides back a second um, to, to have a little visual aid. So I'm going to go to blank here for a second, bring us back to this guy here. Use a good example. There we go. So, um, one of the biggest advantages of being grid tied with the grid with your solar panels is the idea of grid direct or, or direct grid um, interaction. So, th so that means the solar panel, uh, let's see, I think this one would be a better. In a lot of systems, the solar panel goes actually doesn't even make the connection to your home. And so the, I think the most cost-effective way for people is to keep it as simple, kind of the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, right? Which is this connection here is completely eliminated where all it is is the solar panels create their power from the sun and they d deliver that power directly to the grid. And the grid has, in a lot of states, a lot of states are working on developing this now, and a lot of states presently have it, of what we call net metering. And that is the utility is going to pay you for your power at at a, a good rate, basically, based on what power you're providing for your solar panel. A lot of people do one-to-one -one where they'll, whatever is kilowatts um, that they charge you for, they'll, they'll give you um, a negative credit for the same amount per kilowatt hour from your solar panels, which is really helpful. So then you don't have to worry about interfacing that power into your home and getting it to work for your home. It's just literally a way for you to Produce power for the grid and reduce money on your electricity bill, and that connection to your home is not even made. So, so and that's when really the sun goes down, then Ryan, then you still you still get power through the grid. Yes, that is correct. And, and in fact, the what it's kind of hard to see here, but the power is coming from our grid a hundred percent of the time in this case to our home. So this grid is basically our connection all the time for our home. And so the, the only way the solar panels connect is by feeding into the grid and, and spinning our meter backwards during that period of time. And so um, instead of being charged for, you know, a hundred, let's say a, a thousand watts for a certain hour, you're going to only get charged because your, your solar panels produce, let's say 500, then you're only charged for the remaining 500. So that, that really just helps knock down your electricity bills. Now, if you wanted to have the, it where your solar panels directly power your devices in your home. Now that's where the little challenge comes in with um, battery bank backups, because you want to be able to power your home at night with your solar panels. And, and that's where, the, so the, the, the benefit of this is that if you lost grid power, you could still run your stuff. You could actually have, you could have power if you, if the grid goes down, which I know we've all experienced probably outages throughout our lifetime. But the drawback is, the um, not only the cost of the batteries, batteries can be expensive, especially when you get, you probably have to have dozens of these to fit what you need. And so you have to have a big battery bank, but then comes the maintenance of the batteries. The batteries are even ma more maintenance items than the solar panels themselves, because they have to keep corrosion, they have to keep in uh, climate controlled environments and that kind of thing. So, 
and they're you know hazardous chemicals if anything leaks. So kind of all those issues, and we get get into that a little bit more into our two-day version of the class. But I would say if as, as a first kind of crack, if anyone's looking at doing this in their home, do do this way, right? Of just grid direct, plugging them in, so you don't need any of those peripherals. Just get that directly into the grid and start kind of rolling back your electricity cost. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, next question. Uh, you talked about how individual solar cells may fail. Uh, so the question is, are they module? In other words, can individual cells within the panel be replaced? Oh, good question. Um, normally, the module itself is what is what we call UL listed or listed by the underwriter's laboratory as a unit. And so as soon as as soon as you start taking apart the um, the panel, let's say the front glass to get at any one of the individual cells. Usually what's, what um, the underwriter's laboratory would say is you're violating the listing of that device, which means it's no longer, it's warranty is no longer good, that kind of stuff. So you wanna be very careful about taking apart solar panels and trying to troubleshoot them one cell at a time. However, um, a lot of solar manufacturers, um, if, they're, if you're within your warranty period, can go in and either repair those by, by you making a service call to them that will keep this thing listed and in its warranty, or um, that you can literally just, they'll send you a replacement and you can swap them out. Because these usually come with um, these listed connector, connectors called MC4 connectors that you can literally snap in. And then let's say the panel goes bad, for, even if one cell starts under delivering, you can unsnap those connectors and swap out that panel very, very easily. Um, so. I'd say if if you find that one cell is having an issue, which you can, how can you find that one cell in a panel is having an issue? I'll, I would just say that if you guys, the really coolest uh, tool that you can use is an infrared scan. If you guys ever have any infrared um, cameras or devices, I know they're expensive to start out with, but they can be worth their weight in gold. You shine an infrared camera at the face of a solar panel and you, you'll see hot spots. And when you see hot spots, or if you see hot spots glowing red, then you know that those that particular cell is the one that's giving you a problem, whether it's in its electrical connections or whether it's in it's just it's it got damaged in some way. So they get hot when they get damaged. So I would say avoid taking it apart yourself. If you see a let's say one small component of the panel and call that manufacturer first for the warranty. And if it's out of its warranty, I'd say get a replacement panel at that point. A replacement module. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, the next question actually is one that I can answer. Uh, are you aware of any uh, photovoltaic-specific maintenance training? Uh, yes, that is something that TPC training uh, and T TPC Training Co. can do. Uh, it is a topic that we do as an on-site training, meaning we actually bring the training right out to your facility and uh, we teach it directly to uh, you and, and your personnel directly. Um, it's a great opportunity to kind of get that personalized training, but also allows us to tailor it somewhat to uh, your specific needs and your specific facility. And uh, we can even incorporate your own equipment into that as well. And um, it's very likely Ryan might be the one to actually do that for you. So uh, that is an option. Just uh, let us know if, if that's a topic that you're interested in having us uh, talk to you about. Yes, absolutely. And, and one thing. One thing we really uh, uh, pre, uh, we really love doing as part of these on-site trainings is if you guys have a solar panel array in your building that you're looking to understand a little bit more, let's do a little walkthrough together as an instructor. So before the class starts, maybe you can walk me around, show me your readout that you have in the back room. Even if you want to get me up on the roof, that would be awesome. And I, we could we could take a look at the panels you have, look at maybe the schematics you have, and then guess what? The class is going to be customized to exactly what you guys have, and we can start talking about some of the readouts you're getting and some of the issues you're having. And that's what's wonderful about our training classes is that they're fully customized to what you guys need and what you're going through. Um, and, and that's what really makes them not only fun for me, but hopefully useful for you. Um, Cause it's not just some standard me talking at you for eight hours. It's all about interaction. And so it's all about that um, multi kind of working your brain in different ways by interacting and going through activities and doing hands-on activities. Yeah. Ryan, next question is, are there any specific um, manufacturers of solar panel technology that 
that uh, you recommend or that you've heard of does a, does a good job? Uh, I know we don't typically um, like to endorse any one specific company, but are there any, any favorites that you might want to be able to share with people? Sure. Um, there's the leaders. The leaders right now in the uh, manufacturing of solar panels right now are the company First Solar. It's kind of all, I think it's all one word. It might be two words. First Solar, I think, is, is the present leader in the manufacturing of them. And they have a really just good standardized um, line of, of solar panels. So look them up online, First Solar. Uh, Trina Solar is another one that's in this business, T-R-I-N-A. Trina Solar, they're also kind of the top when you look at, you know, who are the top manufacturers. And then Canadian Solar as well. Um, that's a Canadian company, but they do its services in the United States um, as well. So those are three that come to mind immediately. Uh, First Solar, Canadian Solar, and a lot of other companies that I, I got familiar with throughout my career have actually come and gone from the um, solar panel business. For instance, uh, Sharp, who you know makes TVs and, and monitors and stuff like that. They were in the business of solar panels, and they've kind of exited and come back. So, so the solar panel is industry is changing rapidly and and kind of moving toward a lot more players being in that industry. I know there's a lot of local manufacturers and distributors in especially California and these different areas. Um, so definitely, definitely look it up um, and, and look up at the best prices and, and shop around. I, I would always say shop around at least three different manufacturers, look at their spec sheets and see if you can make heads or tails of the efficiency and stuff. And our classes are definitely geared toward, can, can we understand these solar spec sheets and how to read them? And so, yeah, first solar, Trina Solar, Canadian Solar are the three I would, I would lead you to to start with. All right, uh, Ryan. As it relates to specific components, uh, what kinds of technical considerations do you think people should look at uh, or need to be to worry about when selecting uh, components, specifically a charge controller or an inverter? That is a great question. Um, the inverter, in particular, is going to be rated primarily by its current, its maximum current rating. So how, however many amps it's going to be expected to draw. And you might say, well, how do I know how many amps it should be expected to draw? A, a good rule of thumb, and, and this is in the National Electrical Code in Article 690, I, I could, um, I should definitely give you guys over to there. At Article 690 of the National Electrical Code, it tells us what the, what the minimum requirements are for any solar panel system to be considered safe. And they get into the inverters there. Now, I don't want to misquote it, but the inverter is sized based off of the short circuit current. You guys remember that maximum possible current that we could possibly get off of the solar panels? Well, we add them all together from our solar array. And those inverters should be sized based on that current rating of that inverter. For the charge controller, um, it's based off of the overall basically electrons, and a lot of times they're, a charge controller comes paired with the battery, manufacturer's battery, because they have to be able to talk and speak what that battery is. And so those, that's a really good question. Charge controller, it's sized off of its wattage, it's sized off of its maximum current capability. And also these things, a good, a good sizing method for our charge controllers is how it diverts the load. So basically, if you have a solar panel and it is charging the batteries until they get fully charged and then it switches it off. Well, all those electrons need to go somewhere, right? Or else, you know, it will we'll have a problem. So what these charging controllers do is they divert those electrons to another load usually. And so it's usually a light bulb of some sort or some sort of resistor that dissipates that energy, basically has it go to waste because there's nowhere for it to go. Um, so a lot of times these charger controllers are sized based off of the total wattage of that load that would possibly be needed or the maximum of that load. Let's say we had the sunniest day at noon and we suddenly are overcharging our batteries. Can we still run that uh, dis what we call that dispersed, uh, this dispersed load off of this charge controller? So I'll just describe here. There's a little light bulb that comes off of this charge controller, let's say. And it's going to be basically dissipating all that heat and that energy when we cut off the batteries, right? And so we usually these charge controllers are sized based off of the maximum size allowable for that load that, so it won't blow up based on uh, the maximum amount of current we'd be having. And it sounds like a little bit of overkill, 
But that's kind of what the National Electrical Code is all about, is making sure we don't overdo it. And so we get a lot more into these code requirements in the class. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting topic and it's changing by leaps and bounds every single code cycle of the book on new best practices for solar panel systems. All right, uh, only got time for a few more, Ryan, but um, going back to that grid tied system, uh, do you need some kind of a regulator to manage between the solar power and uh, the standalone incoming power from the grid? Good question, let's see. So yes, absolutely. So um, this kind of system is, definitely going to need some synchronization, we call it, because what's coming off of uh, this inverter is a waveform, right? kind of a, a wave of AC. And then what's coming off of this through the utility grid is another wave of AC at 60 hertz, usually, uh, you know, 60 cycles per second. So that's a really fast rotation of the energy. Now, sometimes this one might not be rotating at the exact same time as this one. So they might be what we call out of phase with each other. And so they won't be, so that means one will be actually knocking down the power of another unless they're perfectly in sync with each other. And so, yeah, that, that's where this inverter usually has to incorporate some sort of synchronization. It's, it's communication um, connection through Modbus or CAN bus or some of these other communications that I'm not too, I'm not an expert with, uh, and I'll definitely be the first to tell you, but you can communicate with, from the um, utility grid incoming with your inverter and they synchronize each other as that inverter um, kicks on. So, so that this bus here, that this um, AC signal here is synchronized as one wave that is basically bigger than the two put together and, and combines them in the most efficient way. So yeah, that's absolutely, if we're doing AC coupling, that is the um, state of the art now is to, is to synchronize them. All right. Um, next question. When is battery technology going to have the ability to come off of the grid? In other words, what other options might there be uh, to store energy produced by the solar panels? Other than batteries? Any? Yeah. Like alternatives to batteries? That's a good, good question too. Energy storage has been, it's been a big part of the research I've done back in my uh, master's degree in college and, and looked into as well as, as is I did some market research on what we call smart grid technology. Because the idea of what smart grid is all about is that instead of there being a giant power plant in you know the, the cornfields out there and delivering all the power out to us, which is what kind of we've had over the last century, what if we kind of distributed that power production so that you know homes on every city block had solar panels and they were they were feeding into the grid by the thousands so that these these power plants wouldn't need to use nearly as much, let's say coal and natural gas. And then they could rely on the towns and the businesses and so on and so forth, producing solar panel power across this country. But then it comes the challenge of how are we going to store that? So the state of the art has normally been really heavy, really stationary lead acid batteries, right? With, with um, lead and acid. And you hear lead and you say, whoa, that doesn't sound safe. You hear acid, you say, oh, that doesn't sound safe. But um, since these are sealed sealed um, batteries, th these have been the state of the art. The issue with them is that they don't, um, they're really heavy, but they have, they're really hardy. So they've been the state of the art. Well, we've been slowly going toward lithium ion batteries. And if you guys remember lithium ion batteries being, they're kind of the state of the art when it comes to uh, these new electric vehicles, for instance. And, um, they can get charged a lot more often and a lot more effectively than uh, lead acid batteries. And so a lot of people are looking at them. Now, if you look at a grid level, there's alternatives to batteries too. Now for a given home, like let's say you're looking at alternatives for your home, batteries are, are still by far and away the best way to store your power. But if you look at a grid scale, now people are looking at all sorts of crazy ways like compressed air energy storage is one that a lot of people are looking at. So literally, you can take all the energy these solar panels are producing, use that to run a compressor that'll compress air into a giant cavity underground. And then that compressed air will be released at night and will spin a generator 
and produce that power at night. And in a similar way, there's something we call pumped hydro um, power, which is a grid scale kind of simple method that's been being used for decades, um, if not longer. But we, it's becoming even more reliable because it's just so straightforward and simple, which is we use the energy produced from these solar panels to run a pump, all the ex excess energy anyway that's not being used to run a pump, and that pump is going to pump water up a hill. And then that, that water sits at a reservoir up, upstream or uphill. And so by the time it turns nighttime, we allow that water to fall back down the hill and run a generator with just the power of, of gravity um, to run that. So pumped hydro has been a big, big thing as well for large scale energy storage, as well as, as like we talked about, giant battery banks uh, um, located out at these data centers and at these uh, power plants that literally store just megawatts of power so people are looking at batteries but also these other forms like compressed air and um, storage and there's also air batteries air zinc air batteries that people are looking at that they can power with air and all sorts of other really interesting alternatives there for energy storage so a lot of research going on now and a lot of people smart people out there trying to figure out what the next energy storage will be that's not only safe for the environment but efficient and we won't lose as much power from that solar panel. It's a big challenge right now. I'd say that's the primary challenge right now is energy storage. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, last question we have time for um, goes is related to uh, predictive maintenance on a solar array. Uh, is each solar module monitored electronically, or how do you perform predictive maintenance on panels in a large solar application? Great question. So. In our predictive maintenance courses here, um, I, I'm not a predictive maintenance guy per se, but I have had a, a role in kind of writing up some of our newest material on predictive maintenance with one of our instructors. And I do know that that infrared technology, so there's kind of four main ways we can do predictive maintenance. And one of them is going to be the most important, and that is infrared, right? Infrared scanning is a great way to do predictive maintenance on our solar panels because if you shine this, this infrared scan on all of your solar panels, and you see red spots showing up on just a couple of them, now you know where to start focusing your attention on where the problem is. So that's a way to kind of predict what's gonna go bad first is what's getting hot first. I think that's the first way to, to do some good predictive maintenance on a panel and make that a regular part of your SAP or your, um, your maintenance management system, which says, okay, every six months we're gonna we're going to grease these bearings on these motors. We're going to, you know, clean out these panels, but also we're going to do a infrared scan on our solar panels, right? Some people contract that out. Some people do it themselves. It's really up to you. Um, but another form of predictive maintenance, I mean, usually takes the form of more rotating equipment predictive maintenance, and that's vibration analysis and ultrasound analysis and oil analysis. And so that's not as applicable to solar panels because they're not rotating pieces of equipment. So I'd say the best form of predictive maintenance you can do to find problems before they start is to bake into your schedule these infrared scans um, of your solar panels and where they're heating up. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, folks, we've reached our time limit, uh, but we do wanna thank you again for joining us on our webinar today. Ryan, any parting thoughts? I just thank you guys so much, and uh, there's definitely much more to unpack here when it comes to renewable energy, um, and look forward to hopefully seeing you guys again in, on an on-site class, hopefully in the future. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much.